What if everything stopped working? What if you woke up one morning and nothing worked? What if there was no electricity, no telephones, no cars, no running water? What if everything just stopped working? Well, what if you woke up one day and found that nothing worked? Not your refrigerator, your television, or anything else. I'm not talking about science fiction. It could happen. The threat that is known as electromagnetic pulse, or EMP. EMP? Electromagnetic pulse. Disables any electrical system in the blast radius. And the various ways in which that pulse could afflict a nation like the United States uh, either man-caused or naturally occurring and the repercussions of such an affliction. What is an electromagnetic pulse? Uh, you know, an EMP, think of it as super lightning, except its effects, instead of being on an area, uh, in a, on a point, can be in an area. When you detonate a nuclear weapon at high altitude, at 30 kilometers or, or, or more, you know, it generates a super energetic radio wave that will destroy electronics potentially across a continental-sized area if the altitude is high enough. But even at the le relatively lower altitudes, it basically can cause massive destruction of the electric grid and all the critical infrastructures that, pen that depend upon that. The uh, communications, transportation, food, and water, the things that sustain our modern civilization and life itself, would collapse in the aftermath of an EMP nuclear attack. This can also be caused by the sun, by a solar flare that can generate something very similar to a, a nuclear EMP. We just got hit by a solar flare. An electromagnetic pulse can be devastating uh, to, uh, to the, the, the grid and it is uh, uh, not something that has to be or necessarily will be likely to be uh, carried out by an adversary. It can be carried out uh, by the sun. Electromagnetic pulse, or EMP, is a high-impact, low-frequency event that can disrupt, damage, or destroy electronics. An EMP produces damaging current and voltage surges, burning out the semiconductor chip of any electronic device within line of sight. The result of that is a complete shutdown of the electronic system. They call it an EMP, and we're going to describe it to you the following way based on this animation. As the U.S. goes in, uh, or the map goes in rather, in the United States, you see the areas that light up bright, uh, and then the electric grid would feel the impact of the EMP, then everything goes to darkness. EMP, an electromagnetic pulse that destroys electronic devices and power grids. The single explosion unleashes electronic waves a million times more powerful than any radio signal on Earth. Nearly all computers fail. Telecommunications end. Transportation comes to a halt. The stock market's crippled. Bank accounts disappear. If a coronal mass ejection of a size comparable to the one that took down the Quebec grid in 1989 were to occur, which they say is a certitude at some point in the not too distant future probably, um, 20 to 40 million Americans would be without power, many of them between Washington DC and New York City for up to two years. Warning the earth is susceptible to a major solar storm. It is a storm that could make global warming seem absolutely irrelevant. Uh, it is also a storm that could raise absolute havoc with telecommunication systems, transportation, and much, much more. Inez Foray with our report. If you think New York City in a blackout is bad, imagine a similar scenario across the nation or other parts of the world, all because of a solar storm disrupting our satellites and power grid. Just because a, a solar storm season is, is below average doesn't mean that the intensity of the storms will be any less than what we would get during an extreme cycle. It takes only one solar storm of extreme proportions to cause a lot of damage. In 1989, a solar storm left six million Canadians in the dark. The National Academy of Sciences says a severe solar storm scenario today could cost one to two trillion dollars in damages and take up to ten years to recover. Federal officials warn EMP could paralyze America, instantly returning our country 
to a pre-industrial age. A severe solar-generated geomagnetic storm could shut down, damage, or destroy the power grid and most electronics in major regions or even the entire continental United States. Basically, uh, we would go back to a pre-industrial era overnight in seconds. The electric power grid would be wiped out by the current. Lights and computers, transportation, hospitals, all would go down. The study warns it would be a disaster, far worse than anything we have seen before. The menace of these sunstorms poses a bigger threat to more high-tech and advanced countries like the U.S. Everything from our sewage systems to our Wall Street banks operate with our power grid. And a game-changing solar storm that could hit at any time. Every 11 years, the North Pole and the South Pole of the Sun flip releasing a burst of radiation, but every hundred years or so, a monster tsunami from the sun emerges, which could literally cause trillions of dollars in property damage. The electric uh, grid going down, so farmers' tractors don't work, so trying to figure out how to grow food for all of us. Uh, we have about 2% of the American population growing food. We used to take 40, 50% to feed the rest of us. Now it takes 2% if none of their electrical gear works. Its impact would be so horrifying that we would, in fact, basically lose our civilization in a matter of seconds. Michio, has this happened before? In 1859, we had a humongous storm that wiped out telegraph poles, and we tried to then estimate what kind of power could do that. And we now realize that we are very young in the space age. If something like the 1859 storm hit again, it would literally paralyze all the United States, not just for a day or an hour, but for months to years. A transformers would short circuit and burn out. Satellites would be fried to a crisp. Well, we have never before in our history, in human history for that matter, relied so much on technology as we do today. And that's part of what they found in the study because we rely so much on our ability to communicate through our computers that they would all go down, which would handicap not just New York, but really the eastern half of the United States. There, there's a phenomenon uh, of a coronal mass ejection where large amounts of uh, plasma, or the corona of the sun, are ejected. And if they hit the Earth's geomagnetic field, they produce a significant electromagnetic pulse. Um, and, and the first time this was observed on a large scale was in 1859 in a storm known as the Carrington event. Uh, if an event uh, like that happened today, uh, it would uh, probably bring down the entire grid. The solar storm of 1859, also known as the Carrington Superstorm, was the most powerful sunstorm ever recorded. From the 28th of August, 1859, until the 2nd of September, numerous sunspots and solar flares were observed on the surface of the sun. Just before noon on the 1st of September, the British astronomer Richard Carrington witnessed the largest solar flare ever recorded. The solar flare ejected a plasma cloud that traveled from the surface of the sun for just over 18 hours before finally reaching the Earth. As the dawn broke on the 1st of September 1859, the skies all over planet Earth erupted in red, green, and purple lights, so brilliant that newspapers could be read as if it were daylight. Stunning northern lights pulsated at the tropical latitudes over Cuba, the Bahamas, and Jamaica. Telegraph systems worldwide went haywire, spark discharges shocked telegraph operators and set the telegraph paper on fire. A sunstorm of this sort today could cause billions of dollars of damage to the Earth's satellites and terrestrial power grids, and disrupt radio and cell phone communications. In the 160-year recorded history of geomagnetic storms, the Carrington event is the biggest. 1962, there was a high-altitude test called Starfish Prime in the South Pacific that caused damage in Hawaii some eight or nine hundred miles away, I believe it was. And we were surprised by that. And I can tell you because I also oversaw the underground test programs and so on, EMP was more than an annoyance on the instrumentation, even on underground tests years later. Just a threat from a geomagnetic storm which can occur tomorrow which has not, it's not based on any human intent. Uh, it's just a fact of nature. And uh, as I said, no, no less than five official government studies say it's, it's a probable event. And in fact, the recent Lloyds of London study, Independent, said that it's almost inevitable and that uh, the outages would, 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 would be substantial, occur, uh, take years to repair. 
in terms of a the most serious short-term national security threat, I believe, is, is man-made EMP, then we should be paying more attention to it than we are. Now, I know that a, a lot of people, when they talk about EMP, the first thing they do is to emphasize the significance of a, you know, a, a worst-case scenario. And I'll just, just suggest to you that uh, there have been a number, a number of studies that have been done here to where we know uh, that there is consensus that if a major cataclysmic type EMP event occurred, whether it was GMD or whether it was a, a man-made, a, a high-altitude electromagnetic pulse weapon, uh, the results would be devastating to our society. In a, in a worst-case scenario, um, it's just almost beyond my ability to describe because almost everything that we do in our country now is somehow dependent or interdependent on electricity. It, it represents I think in the words of Brink Lindsay, he, you know, he talked about um, who knows what kind of a breakdown of civilization may occur, that there's this thin veneer on our civilization. And we're one act of madness away from a social cataclysm unlike uh, any of us have ever known. There is a new terror study out, a bit frightening too, getting our attention today, warning the U.S. of a clear and present danger on a massive scale. It's called an electromagnetic pulse attack, otherwise known as EMP. R.P. Eddies, former director of terrorism at the White House's National Security Council, here to talk through it. Good morning, R.P. Welcome back. Morning, Bill. How would you describe this EMP? Well, an electromagnetic pulse is a result of a nuclear explosion or another weapon that releases a wave of electrons that will fry every electronic gizmo or tool that, that, uh, that civilization needs to survive. Well, who, who would likely use a weapon like that? Well, we know that major civilizations, major nations have built electromagnetic pulse weapons. They're, they're potentially a very effective weapon, but they're not that complicated to make, and it's likely that terrorists could actually make some of the weapons, or countries like Iran and North Korea could use their nuclear weapons to create an electromagnetic pulse. Do we know or can we pinpoint which groups or which countries might have this already? Well, there's, as I said, there's a threat that you don't need to build an electromagnetic pulse weapon specifically. You can use a nuclear weapon, and uh, you don't have to have as accurate or as long range a missile to deliver it. So Iran could use a barge, which they've tested before, park it off of the United States somewhere, and use one of their Scud missiles to shoot a nuclear weapon. Over see, the so, so your point is, if, if you're nuclear capable, you're also capable with an EMP. Is That's what right. You're saying. The That's absolutely correct. The bad news is, you can also build an EMP weapon. Uh, much more easily than actually all it takes to build a nuclear weapon. My next guest says a rogue nation doesn't have to hit our territory to destroy that grid. William Forstian, an expert in what's called an electromagnetic pulse. He's also the author of the book One Second After. Sir, good morning to you. You out there? Uh, good morning. Uh, How are you doing you. I'm today? doing fine. Listen, is North Korea capable of this? Fully. Uh, we are dealing with at least two rogue nations. Uh, on Jan excuse me, on February the 3rd, Iran launched a satellite. That missile is an ICBM. North Korea is obviously preparing to have ICBMs. And with such weapons, an EMP weapon, meaning a small nuclear bomb, detonated above the center of the United States would literally take down the entire power grid of this country. Wow. Plunging us back three to four hundred years. By 2015, Iran's ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, will have the capability of reaching the United States. Why does Iran need that capability? It already covers, its missile capability covers the entire Middle East. The Iranian and North Korean partnership uh, is accelerating the capabilities in both nuclear warhead and in missile delivery systems. Uh, and uh, they are, uh, this is a very dangerous development that needs to be monitored. Pentagon estimates show that by the year 2015, Iran could have missiles capable of reaching the east coast of the United States. One of the nightmare scenarios the Congressional EMP Commission had was the possibility of a rogue state or terrorist group, and they specifically considered both Iran and North Korea when examining this threat, making an EMP attack against the United States by launching a primitive missile off of a freighter near the U.S. coast. It was identified that you don't need ICBMs or even long-range satellites or anything like that to attack the United States. 
A nuclear weapon detonated above the U.S. would emit powerful electromagnetic pulses, frying America's electrical grid and shutting down necessities from cars to computers to airplanes and refrigerators. Iranian military handbooks point out the benefits of such an attack, and Russia, China, and North Korea also possess EMP technology. A single nuclear weapon will cause the collapse of the electric power grid and all the critical infrastructures and other electronic systems across the entire continental United States and basically cause a, uh, a permanent blackout. Prize nightmare scenario shows Iran or its terrorist proxy Hezbollah parking an unmarked freighter off America's east coast or in the Gulf of Mexico. They would fire a nuclear tip scud above a city like New York. We are at war now with those who want to take down our electricity grid. Within a year of an, of an EMP event, uh, at least two-thirds of the American population would perish from a starvation, disease, and societal collapse. When a nuclear weapon goes off a couple hundred miles above the United States, no one gets hurt immediately. Um, the lights go out, uh, and everything that's powered by the grid goes out. Um, and that includes a whole host of things you might think about and some things you might not think about. I mean, water, you lose water. Uh, you lose the power for your sewage. Imagine being in a, you know, a hundred-story building or whatever, and gravity takes over. And um, how, 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 how you manage life, and any more, I don't know whether you can open these windows here or not. You don't have air conditioning. You don't have all the neat things that we've come to rely upon. And you have chaos. Uh, pretty quickly. And that's where people die uh, if we aren't prepared. And how much attention is the U.S. military giving it? I think the U.S. military is thinking about this, and they have for decades. So they're paying attention to it from a, um, a continuity perspective. But that doesn't mean that civilization in this country is paying attention to it. Well, you think it. about this for a moment. How much of our lives are run on electricity? That's right. Um, just about everything. Have you taken, I would assume you've made this presentation to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Because of all people, I mean, they don't want station blackout. In the wake of Fukushima, loss of off-site power, every civilian nuclear plant has diesel generators. But you run out of diesel pretty fast. Right. It's always assumed that the off-site power will be restored, and the on-site diesel generators are a temporary thing. Yeah. This a general EMP would have Fukushimas all over the country. Yes, popping absolutely. Yep. Every week. If there was ever a prolonged power outage from a geomagnetic storm, that the backup power that keeps the spent fuel at nuclear reactors from overheating uh, might not have the resiliency to maintain those cooling effects, and you would end up seeing uh, uh, the spent fuel, which is not in containment, burst, uh, uh, burst into flames and having uh, generating a great radiation uh, 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 disaster. This is what a nuclear reactor looks like. The uranium inside the fuel rod inside the reactor undergoes nuclear fission. The rods emit heat, generating energy. Usually water cools them to maintain their temperature at 270 degrees Celsius. But if the cooling fails, the temperature could rise to over 1200 degrees. This temperature is hot enough to melt the fuel rods. Water should have been circulated to cool them down. However, this didn't happen. Because of a power outage, the emergency diesel power generator began spraying the rods with coolant. But an hour later, something unexpected happened. Without warning, the emergency generator stopped. Once again, nature has challenged man's best efforts. The worldwide loss of electricity reaches the nuclear power plants. Automated systems detect the electrical grid is failing and they shut off the reactors. But this is just the beginning. Emergency backup systems are sustaining the world's nuclear power plants. Automatic diesel generators have kicked in to prevent a catastrophic meltdown. But the diesel fuel won't last forever. At nuclear power plants, emergency diesel generators started working as soon as the electricity failed. But without power, this building and hundreds like it 
will soon cause an unprecedented disaster. This is the spent fuel handling building, where radioactive fuel is stored in cooling pools after it's used to generate power. The spent fuel is contained in zircaloy tubes, and they're dangerous. If they're not kept underwater, they'll quickly heat up to 1,000 degrees. They need to be kept in flowing, refrigerated water for years before they cool off. Nuclear storage sites can be found all over the world. There are 75 in the U.S. alone. The spent fuel is safe as long as the generators stay on and keep the water cool. The power goes off for good inside the spent fuel buildings. The cool water stops flowing. The temperature starts to rise. In just a few days, the water will boil and evaporate. A nuclear disaster greater than the world has ever seen is now inevitable. A massive dose of radiation, 500 times greater than what was unleashed on Hiroshima, will be released. For days, superheated steam has been escaping from the spent fuel building of this nuclear power plant. With no emergency power, there's nothing to keep the fuel from heating up. The fuel burns through casings and sets fire to everything in the room. Radiation equal to 500 atomic bombs is about to explode. This is a nuclear disaster, and there's no one to stop it. A deadly mix of radioactive particles spews from the plant. Some of them, like strontium-90, will be dangerous for 300 years. Plutonium will be radioactive for 240,000 years. This scene is repeated again and again. Nuclear power poisons the earth. There are six nuclear power plants in Illinois. Radioactive smoke fills the streets of Chicago, the site of the world's first self-sustaining nuclear reaction. Fires break out at many of the 30 nuclear plants located in the eastern U.S. Each one is almost 20 times more radioactive than the Chernobyl disaster. Many of Europe's 173 reactors also ignite. Their spent fuel burns. Carried by the wind, the radiation is an invisible poison that settles over thousands of square miles. It would cause cancer in millions of people. Giant plumes of radioactive smoke and particles spread across the northern hemisphere. Winds push radiation away from the reactors in Europe. If conditions are right, it could reach as far as North Africa. Radiation from some of Japan's 53 reactors drifts across the Pacific Ocean. The world's most remote islands are in its path. Rain washes much of the radiation from the sky, concentrating its deadly effects.
haven't insulated the grid, uh, ev- everything could go down. I'll tell you what concerns me too, Mitch, is mm-hmm. what happens if the power goes out? What about all our nuke plants? And we won't have the ability to, you know, you know, they will melt down, won't they? Yeah, take a look at what happened in Japan. You know, the the backup power generators were in the basement. You can't think of anything worse, any worse place to put a generator than in the basement of a building. It was flooded almost immediately by the tsunami. And so the reactor almost instantly was dead in the water. They had no power. And because they had no power, there was no safety systems. And then three, we had three simultaneous core meltdowns in Fukushima. Plus, the uranium actually liquefied. Liquefied. We've never seen a totally liquefied core before. First time in history. But the Fukushima reactor actually melted totally. And so we could have lots of these around the country if there's a power blackout because of a solar flare. Simultaneously, we, we, lose, we lose pump activity. We lose backup power. We lose the ability to control the control rods. It would be a nightmare. And, and how long? That, uh, well, it only takes uh, a few hours for a core meltdown to get off the ground. Yeah. And by the way, at the Fukushima, you may ask yourself a simple question. If the core melted completely, then how come we didn't have a China syndrome? How come there wasn't an explosion that blew the roof off like Chernobyl? And the reason is that in Fukushima, one of the workers disobeyed orders. He was under a direct order not to flush the core with seawater, because that would destroy the core. The utility thought they could re- uh, revive the reactor still. They had illusions about that. But he disobeyed orders. He made the only correct decision during the first few days. He flooded the reactor with seawater, and he stopped the devastation of northern Japan. He's a national hero. He is. And he, he disobeyed may, orders. He may have saved many, many lives. Oh, definitely. And we could have something similar if we lose power uh, in the United States or, you know, uh, around the planet Earth. If there's a gigantic solar storm, if there's a hurricane from hell if from outer space, now, we physicists went to Congress last year, and we asked Congress for a few hundred million dollars, that's chump change, to reinforce our power plant, to build a backup grid, to make our satellites so that we could shut them down in case of a major flare, or maybe even have a safety systems on the next generation of satellites. And we got nothing. Congress oh. just laughed at us. But, you know, oh. we're the physicists of this country. We're the American Physical Society. We're the organization of physicists in this country. And we said to Congress that these are rare events, maybe once in 100 years, once in a 200-year event, but it's inevitable. It's inevitable that one of these bullets is going to hit the Earth like what happened 150 years ago. Power blackouts have happened because of sunspot activity in Quebec, Canada, for example, and in in South Africa. Uh, Certain cities uh, were hit with solar flares, but they were not a direct hit. They were like a grazing blow to the Earth. And uh, we've had power blackouts. But these solar flares have been going on for billions of years. But we never had electricity for billions of years. We've only had electricity for 100 years. And so we have no experience with one of these things. And so it's just like hurricanes. You know, people think that, yeah, hurricanes are bad, but they're very rare. So why bother to prepare for them? Then one day it hits you, and then you lose $50 billion, like in Hurricane Sandy. Yeah, I, I think it's foolish that they're not doing this, Mitch. They should have jumped all over your proposals, and that it should have been implemented right now. We, sh- we should be building infrastructure right now, insulating the grid, protecting our power plants. Uh, it, it's going to bite us one day. I just I can feel it. That's right. And, you, you know, you can imagine the chaos. I'll, if all of a sudden we have power blackouts simultaneously across the country, no rescue crews are going to come in from neighboring cities because they, too, will be knocked out. But you're not going to see ambulances and fire trucks from neighboring cities to, to take care of us in case of a power blackout. And then food is going to rot in refrigerators, you know, as what happened with Hurricane Sandy. It only takes a few days for food to rot. And new food is not going to come in from the outside, because there is no outside. And so food riots are going to start in a few days, because people realize that uh, there's no food to eat because all the food is rotten because there's no electricity. And so you can imagine the kind of chaos you're going to have. Now, here in the Northeast, we had Hurricane Sandy, but, you know, we got relief from the outside. You know, the rest of the country was not paralyzed. That's right. Uh, the airports were up and running in a few days, and so shipments of food, trucks can come in. But can you imagine what happens if there's no outside, that if they, too, are hit simultaneously with one of these solar flares? There will be more and more newspaper reports, uh, especially from NASA, monitoring the sun, because we never used to do this before, by the way. 
We never used to monitor these things. Now we monitor them because now we begin to realize, oh, my God, this yeah. could really be a big one. The Carrington event is a once in 500 years occurrence. This cloud is on a collision course for Earth. A fossil sized balls of turbulence. Major damage and knocked out power to most part of Ontario. Are we looking at days, hours? Grandpa, what's happening? It'll be hard, sweetie. So what happened? What, what about the power? Well, hell's breaking loose. I know. Fuel's running low. It's the city. Burning. We found evidence of a series of super flares from the star in the outer Pleiades region. Right? Ratings were off the chart. We're both wrong. The numbers are a warning, but not just to me or any random group. They're a warning to everyone. Okay, you're officially scaring the shit out of me right now. A super flare. In our own solar system. We have to let everyone know. When the network went down, it triggered some kind of pulse, wiped out all our technology, and sent us here, back to the dark ages. EMP, armed, and ready. EMP. Electromagnetic pulse disables any electrical system in the blast radius. Hang on a minute, hang on. We could use a pinch. What's a pinch? A pinch is a device which creates like a cardiac arrest for any broadband electrical circuitry. Or better yet, a pinch is a bomb. No, but without the bomb. See, when a nuclear weapon detonates, it unleashes an electromagnetic pulse which shuts down any power source within its blast radius. Now, that tends not to matter in most cases because a nuclear weapon usually destroys everything you might need power for anyway. But see, a pinch creates a similar electromagnetic pulse but without the fuss of mass destruction and death. So instead of Hiroshima, you'd be getting the 17th century. How long? About 30 seconds. Could a pinch knock out the power of an entire city? Like, for instance... Las Vegas? Yeah, I think it might. No, but there's only one pinch in the world big enough to manage it. Where? This instruction disc hooks you right into the Sword of Damocles, the ultimate defensive weapon system. You see that? There's a ring of satellites encircling the Earth. Attached to each satellite is a mega neutron bomb. When detonated, each satellite unleashes an intense electromagnetic pulse. But EMP doesn't harm a living thing. What it does do he shut down every known power source. All electrical devices, cars, airplanes, toasters, computers, everything, even batteries. But this makes this an aiming device that gives the user incredible accuracy. You can pinpoint precisely what you want to shut down. The taxi cab in Buenos Aires, the entire country of Spain. Amazing, brilliant. Hell, you could key in all the satellites and shut down the whole planet. Send it right back to the Dark Ages. Let's say hold it. Sir, the enemy is less than two minutes from our shore. What's it to be, Pliskin? Us or them? Shut down the third world. They lose.
lose, you win. Shut down America. You lose, they win. The more things change, the more they stay the same. So what are you going to do? Disappear. He's entered the world code. No target code. Sir, that'll shut down the entire planet. Push that button. Everything we've accomplished for the past 500 years will be finished. Our technology, our way of life, our entire history. We'll have to start all over again. For God's sakes, don't do it, Snake! The name's Pliskin. Hollywood and uh, late night TV and novelists are well ahead of the government of the United States on, uh, on this matter. Professor, should we be worried about these flare-ups, uh, or you know, is if you know, when talking about this this morning, we all kind of agreed it has that Y2K feeling, like it could happen. But if it doesn't, we're going to spend a lot of money for nothing. Hmm. Well, we had a wake-up call just two weeks ago. Giant auroras, northern lights as far as Michigan and Wisconsin. And that's a warm-up. And, and there are some people who want to say that EMP is a figment of a bunch of technical guys in their, um, in their imagination. And I can assure you it isn't. See, I mean, this is seriously a possibility? That's right. NASA and um, the scientists in this country are taking this very seriously. We take for granted that uh, our society as a whole, below our national command authority, will continue to function in the event of an EFP. That is not the case. I can tell you that I have spent now since, I guess it's been 10 years, 11 years since I was mobilized and came back on active duty, I have seen preparations at the national level at the National Guard Bureau at the Pentagon. I have uh, been an assistant Homeland Security Advisor to Governor Mark Warner, and as Adjutant General to Governor Tim Kaine, none of these planning scenarios ever crossed our desks. And I left, uh, I left uniform service uh, three years ago, so unless something has happened over the last three years, which I don't think it has, we remain vulnerable as a National Guard to fully respond to an event caused by an EMP and then to carry on operations once we're on duty. Labored on this for a decade and pro pro produced a blueprint for protecting the country that has still not been implemented. This country is not well served by the way the electric grid is protected or by the people who are doing it. It's inexcusable 
that uh, the, the, uh, ma uh, the maintainers of this infrastructure, let alone the Department of Homeland Sec Security, which is statutorily responsible for protecting the critical infrastructure, has taken no act action on this. This is a real threat. We know about it. And the frustrating aspect of all this is they had a commission that put reports out on this years ago that projected 90% of all Americans could be dead within a year after such an attack. What are we doing or what are we working on to prevent it? Nothing. Hope is not a strategy. And that's what we're doing regarding an EMP. We're sitting back and crossing our fingers and hoping that this doesn't hit. We need to prepare for this. We need to do this not only at the national security level with the national command authority and our military, but also to bring it down through the state level. And unless we begin to make efforts now to reinforce our satellites and power grid, we could have something maybe 10 times bigger than Katrina because we're talking about the loss of all electricity and all satellite activity. We'd be throwing 100 years back into the past. You have to prepare for things, especially when you know that at some point it's inevitable that we're going to have another big one, like we had back in 1859, except this time we're totally dependent on electricity. It, it would cost very little to begin the process of reinforcing our transformers, power stations. And remember, this does happen even periodically. In 2003 in South Africa, 14 power stations were wiped out because a solar flare hit South Africa. In Canada, uh, the city of Quebec was partially paralyzed, uh, again, about 10, uh, 15 years ago because of a solar flare. These things happen. And it's inexcusable for a nation with the wealth and the economy that we have that the insignificant funds necessary to protect what has been deemed inevitable are not being expended to keep the population safe. The cost of securing our electric grid against an EMP is not an insurmountable sum. Estimates have ranged from hundreds of million dollars to protect the grid against a solar storm to approximately $2 billion to secure the grid against a high-altitude EMP. Now, while neither sum is trivial, and I don't expect anyone to, to, try, uh, to expect this to be funded overnight, it certainly is affordable to a country like the United States that has come to depend on electricity to power every aspect of our modern life. Now also, when we view the, uh, these costs uh, in, in light of their cost of recovery from an EMP, uh, it's, it's trivial in nature. Some estimates say that just in the first month alone, the first four weeks after an EMP event, costs could range between one and two trillion dollars. Mm -hmm. So match that against the cost of building a system that's redundant or that is shielded against an EMP, and you can see that a penny saved today is certainly worth or the pain that we'd suffer down the road if we turn our head. Now let's compare that against a Northeast blackout. In 2003, 50 million people in the Northeast Corridor were blinded because of that transformer cascading effect that went down through, uh, throughout the Northeast Corridor. They lost power for only two days. 11 people lost their lives due to the blackout and the economic damage was estimated to be at six billion dollars. You're talking about 12 cents per person per year one time to pay for a fix with respect to solar EMP. If you do nuclear, multiply by four. 50 cents per person per year for one year to fix this. Everybody has to be equally responsible in, ta in taking the relatively low-cost measures that are necessary, but they must do it. Right now, they're not doing it voluntarily, and nobody in the government has the authority to tell them to do it. That's why the SHIELD Act is absolutely necessary. The SHIELD Act is the successor to the GRID Act. Legislation is currently pending in Congress that would harden America's electrical grid against an EMP attack. Sponsors of the bill, called the SHIELD Act, say it would cost less than $1 billion to do it. The bill, however, has yet to pass. I'm convinced that apart from some type of hardware-based solutions in our grid, that we are failing the test of our time. And that's why we're doing everything we can to see the SHIELD Act passed in the Congress. And the, the SHIELD Act, without any arrogance whatsoever, it does deal with the problem. If we have the SHIELD Act in place and it's implemented, we will be able to prevent this cataclysmic issue. doesn't mean we'll solve all the ancillary issues with EMP. That's a, that's a big project. But at least as a society, we will continue to function, and we will be maybe dealing with inconveniences rather than a cataclysmic meltdown. Encourage your own representatives to sign on to the SHIELD Act and also 
the Homeland Security bill that we're going to be dropping here in, in, in imminent uh, time frame. The Department of Homeland Security, you know, should implement a new national planning scenario focused on EMP. This was a core recommendation of the EMP Commission made back in 2008. You know, these national planning scenarios are the basis for all federal, state, and local emergency planning, training, and resource allocation. Even if you can't get the SHIELD Act passed, at least if you had the national planning scenario focused on EMP, it would be an enormous step toward getting the whole country protected. You have to give enormous credit to the state of Maine. I hope the whole country follows the example of Andrea Boland, state representative from the state of Maine, who heroically, back in February, introduced a bill called LD-131 to the Maine State Legislature. And, you know, she's a liberal Democrat from the state of Maine who said, we're tired of waiting for Washington, you know, uh, you know, geomagnetic storms, nuclear MP, non-nuclear MP, these pose a mortal threat to the people of the state of Maine. And, and it took her, it took her exactly, let's see, from February to, uh, to June. It took a few months for the state of Maine you know, to actually pass LD-131. They are the first state in the United States who have passed a bill. They're not waiting for Washington. They're going to move forward and protect their grid. And that's an example. If Washington will not act, then the states should act to protect their people. I recommend people listening, I know some people think this might sound a bit like sci-fi, go on Wikipedia for half an hour. Look up electromagnetic pulse. Go on my website, onesecondafter.com, where I do provide links and information on how to prepare. Simple preparation at the home level. What did Katrina teach us? Katrina taught us don't wait for the feds to come and save you. If we have an EMP strike on this country, our citizens will be on their own for weeks, perhaps months. Welcome to the human.